So, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, buonasera, invece buona giornata se siete adesso negli Stati Uniti. Uh, uh, welcome, really welcome uh, to our conference, uh, Dante Poet of World Literature, Globalism, Philology, and the Future of Literary Studies on this very celebratory occasion of the seventh centenary of Dante's death. We are delighted to have you all uh, with us this evening, and albeit only in this online format. When we began to think about this gathering, it was somewhere, sometime I think in early 2019, and who knew then what COVID-19 means and how the world is going to change soon. But things have indeed changed, and the pandemic required us first to postpone the original dates of the gathering in the hope that we will still be able to hold it physically in Jerusalem. And then uh, with the variants and other challenges, we had to uh, hold it in this online format. But we of course hope to make the best of this format in the coming three days, and not least by taking advantage of uh, its global dimension. It's really in this respect wonderful to see here uh, colleagues and friends from, from all over the world, so, so welcome. Now, before continuing in presenting our conference, uh, the aim and scope of our conference, I would like to invite um, Professor Nisim Otmezgin, who is the Dean of Humanities at the Hebrew University, uh, to say uh, a few welcoming words. Uh, Professor Otmezgin, it is a pleasure to have you with us, and, and please, the, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, hello uh, and welcome from rainy Jerusalem, from my office at the top of Mount Scopus. So uh, my name is Nisim Mosgin, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the Hebrew University. And I'm really honored to open this two-day symposium in honor of Dante, 700 years from his death, with colleagues and experts from all over the world, organized by the Department of Roman Studies and the Department of Comparative Literature. This compelling conference is tackling Dante's actuality as poet of world literature, of global culture, in which not only philology uh, is at stake, but the future of liter literary studies that is the humanities at large. Even before the foundation of the State of Israel, Dante was translated into Hebrew by Shaul Folmigini uh, in 1869. And after, uh, in the newborn state by Emmanuel Olswanger between 1944 and 1956. And by uh, eminent scholar among them, uh, Luisa Fer uh, Ferretti uh, Cuomo, Professor Emerita of Linguistic and Italian Philology at the Hebrew University. And the former head of the former, de of the former Department of Italian Literature and Language. It is worth to mention her translation of the Inferno with Yoav Rinon of the Department of Comparative Literature, as well as the complete translation of Divine Comedia by Ruven Cohen. As a scholar of modern Japan myself, I am aware of Dante's Fortuna in Japan that even uh, rather recent compared to other countries show the profound depth that Japanese culture felt for the Florentine poet. Just briefly to say that it, be, it begins with the advent of the Meiji era, the Meiji Restoration between 1868 and 1912, when the reforms promoted by the imperial government opened the country to Western culture and Japanese scholars began to take an interest in foreign literature and therefore also in, Ita in the Italian one. Mori Ogai, a doctor, a medical doctor who gained fame as a novelist, was the first Japanese to mention Dante. He recounts that in July 1885, while he was in Leipzig as a student, he read the comedy uh, in the German version by Streckfuss. Wedderbin, professor at the University of Kyoto, where I studied for many years, published in 1895 the, in the magazine Bungo Kukai, uh, Literature, Literary World, uh, a first article enti entitled uh, Dante, and since then, he collected his series of lectures and published a single volume in Tokyo in 1901, entitled She uh, Say Dante, Dante the, Divide, the Divine Poet. He enthusiastically uh, exalted not only in the of the beauty 
of the lines of the comedy, but also the depth of Dante's political thought. Since then, a large number of, number of translations of Dante works appeared in the numerous scholarly studies that shows, even though that they might seem works of appropriate and dissemination, the incredible success of Dante in Japan. So here I'm trying to connect somehow Italy, Israel, and Japan together. I wish to thank uh, the organizers and the participants' fruitful days of work, and I want to thank in particular the Instituto Italia, Italiano di Cultura in the Tel Aviv and its director, Dr. Maria Sica, for her cooperation, hoping to see you all soon here at the Hebrew University. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Manuela Consoni and Dr. Gurzak, the organizers of such a wonderful event. And I would like to finish with a few words about what is my recipe for successful conference, which was taught by my professor back here at the Hebrew University. And according to my professor, he told me that if you are in a conference and you hear this marvelous talk and everything makes sense and the empirical parts are perfect and theoretically it is well developed and analytically it is superb, the first thing you have to say is exactly the opposite and voice it very loudly because this is how science progresses. So this is what I wish for your conference. Please think different than what you think, especially if you think that the talk is excellent. So I wish you all an enjoyable and fruitful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nissen, for these wonderful words and uh, really bringing together Japan and Italy and Israel. This is the idea of a conference, world literature. So, so thank you for that. And um, so it will, give me a way to um, enter again my, my presentation and um, to speak a little about our conference and um, just a sec. I have to share my screen again. Okay, so let me say a few more words about our conference and uh, its aim and scope. So the aim of a conference, as our title suggests, is to bring together the vibrant field of Dante studies with its strong philological roots and the recent turn toward world literature in literary studies with its aim of studying literature on a global scale. Our goal is to examine what each of these fields may tell us about the other and what the attempt to bring them together may mean for the future of literary studies in general. The title of a conference, Dante Poet of World Literature, consciously refers to two classic studies by Eric Auerbach, one of the greatest scholars of Dante, as well as one of the founding fathers of the discipline of comparative literature. The first study is his classic book from 1929, sorry, translated into English as Dante, Poet of the Secular World, in which Auerbach used his superb philological skills to formulate his thesis on Dante's figural realism. The second study is his 1952 essay, Philology and World Literature, Philology and Weltliteratur, which he wrote following his move to Princeton in the aftermath of World War II. In this essay, which marks for many the beginning of the turn towards world literature and literary studies, Auerbach asked how new generations of scholars may pursue the work of philology, that is, as we know, the study of literature that is deeply attuned to historical and linguistic context in an age of globalization, a time in which the amount of materials available for study grows steadily, yet school systems around the world put less and less emphasis on the study of languages and historical context. And he said that in, in the 1950s, right? Now Auerbach's own answer to his question in that essay, I think, was that the honors still lies on the scholar's intuition. It is the scholar's task to find what Auerbach called a handle, a point of departure, Ansatzpunkt, that, uh, and he described it as, and I quote very briefly, 
uh, this handle may be a semantic interpretation, a rhetorical trope, a syntactic sequence that would serve as the foundation around which the study of various texts from various cultures may revolve. His solution at that essay sounds quite close to his own method in his unquestionable masterwork mimesis, the representation of reality in Western literature or, or Western thought, which he had famously written in his place of refuge in Istanbul during World War II. Now in recent decades, our back question generated many responses. Two of the most influential ones have been those of the Italian scholar Franco Moretti and the Harvard critic David Damage. Moretti on one side famously contended that in order to study world literature, we need to disavow close reading, the prerogative of philologists, and turn to what Moretti called distant reading, that is the pursuit of universal literary rules and patterns discoverable in his view through the holy grail of digitalization and big data. The old type of doing literary studies, which Moretti lampooned as German scholars probing over a handful of French canonical works was in his view unjustifiable anymore, no more than a thinly veiled form of theology. Damrosch, on his part, has been more favorable towards the old Arabakian scholarship and suggested that world literature should involve the study of the migration of texts, the inquiry into the dynamics of their appropriation and reception, both on the material and conceptual levels as they cross their original linguistic and cultural borders. In his uh, most recent book, Comparing the Literatures, Literary Studies in the Global Age, published last year, Damrosch emphasized the need to look for new creative ways of bringing together the different strands that dominated literary studies in the past few decades. And he mentioned specifically philology, world literature, and post-colonial theory. It is notable to our purposes that Damrosch concluded his book with a discussion of a giant wall painting this wall painting painted by three Chinese artists, uh, Dai Dudu, Li Tietzi, and Zhang An in 2006 in Beijing. And this wall painting is called Discussing the Divine Comedy with Dante. And uh, this is really a huge painting. It's six meters and two and a half meters uh, uh, in size. And it includes exactly hundred figures from the entire world history from philosophers to politicians to movie stars, from Archimedes to Napoleon to Shirley Temple and Elvis Presley, they're all there. And they all discuss world history with Dante. And you have Dante on the upper right-hand corner of, of the painting, looking at all this uh, really human uh, uh, comedy. Now, it is this global perspective, interestingly rooted in Dante, that Damrosch urges literary scholars to find new ways to probe. So with this challenge and various considerations in mind, we invited our contributors to offer papers that will reflect on the meaning of Dante studies in an age of globalization and the way philology and world literature may come together. We invited papers on the dynamics of reception of Dante's works in various national and temporal context, and on the way Dante's own preoccupations and concerns may speak to our current anxieties and disquiets, whether in question of exile and migration, borders and border crossing, and justice and compassion. At bottom, I think that all of us who are here today believe that there is something outstanding perennial in Dante's masterpiece, and that probing upon it has the capacity to tell us something meaningful and new each time we turn to it. To use Calvino's famous words in Perché leggere i classici, why read the classics? The Commedia is one of those works that help us define ourselves, discover who we are through our engagement with it. Our conference, if you wish, may be regarded as a concentrated attempt to respond to Moretti's challenge 
against the study of canonical works in an age of globalization. And we entered this challenge with Il Nostro Autore, Il Nostro Maestro Dante as our guide. And let's hope that, that our journey will be a useful and, and stimulating one. So before moving on to our opening presentation, I would like to use the opportunity uh, to warmly thank my co-organizers uh, of this uh, conference, Professor Manuela Consoni and Dr. Chiara Caradonna from the Department of Roman Studies at the Hebrew University and Professor Yoav Rinon from the Department of Comparative Literature. I would also like to thank Dr. Fabio Ruggirello, with whom we, we began to discuss this conference more than two years ago, and Dr. Essa Maria Sica, the director of the Istituto Italiano di Cultura Tel Aviv, which provided us with much appreciated support. And uh, also, last but not least, uh, Professor Ilana Pardes, the head of the Center for Literary Studies at the Hebrew University, which very generously supported our conference. So thank you uh, to all of, of those who, who really took part in, in uh, putting this conference together. And I think now that uh, without uh, um, uh, further ado, we can um, continue to our opening presentation. Um, okay. So, um, Dr. Esa Sika was unfortunately not being, is not able to be with us today due to personal reason. So I have the honor uh, to introduce Professor uh, Alessandro Barbero, uh, our keynote speaker. Alessandro Barbero was born in Turin in 1959. He is professor of medieval history at l'Università del Piemonte Orientale. Professor Barbero is a highly prolific author, well-known both in Italy and uh, uh, throughout the world. In 1996, he won the prestigious Premio Strega, the Strega Prize for his historical novel, Bella Vita e Guerre Altrui di Mr. Pile Gentil Uomo, published by Mondadori in 1995. Uh, this book was later translated to uh, uh, seven languages. His most recent books include the biography of the Emperor Constantine, Constantino Vincitore, and of course, the uh, very well received biography Dante, which was published by La Terza last year and is currently being translated to uh, uh, several languages. Beyond that, uh, Professor Barbero has for many years been a regular contributor to daily newspaper La Stampa and to various uh, uh, TV shows uh, in Italy, above all in Rai Storia and, and other uh, uh, networks. So uh, today, Professor Barbero will open our conference with a talk on Dante before world literature, uh, a poet is in, in his own space and time. And uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Barbero. Um, and as I said before, the screen is, is, is yours. So, so please, I will stop share now. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning to our friends in America. Uh, so the title uh, chosen for my intervention is exactly that, Dante before world literature, a poet in his own space and time. Now, Thomas Stearns Eliot once famously said that Dante and Shakespeare divide the modern world between them. There is no third, end of quote. How Dante, a man who belonged so deeply in his own time and place, managed to become a poet of world literature to tackle once and for all the subject of this conference, the colleagues who will take the floor after me will discuss. My task, since you have conferred upon a historian the great honor of this opening lecture, will be to fix uh, the point of departure, so to say, of your journey, to map the ground in time and space in which this man was so firmly anchored 
and from which his poetry took wings to conquer ages and continents. Was Dante a modern man, which is not the same as a modern poet? Well, of course, in a sense, he was. Anybody in the high and later Middle Ages, um, I mean, anybody sophisticated enough as to share an interest in such questions, knew that they and their contemporaries were the moderns, since they were not the ancients. The timeline of world history had been sharply divided by the single most important event in its course, Christ's birth and passion. And those who lived after that event knew something that people who had lived before al tempo degli dei falsi e bugiardi could not know. It was no matter how great the ancients had been, and very great they had been. Nobody like Aristotle or Plato, like Virgil or Statius, lived in Dante's time. Yet, those who had been born later knew more. They were, to quote inevitably, the old commonplace of medieval thought, like dwarfs on the shoulders of giants, seeing farther than the giants ever would. No matter how much Dante respects and honors his guide Virgil, he will be admitted into paradise, while Virgil will not. The painters who illustrated the comedy's earlier manuscripts knew very well that Dante and Virgil came from two different ages. Dante was represented in the usual garb of a citizen of his own time, which means, by the way, not in the scarlet attire and laurel crown reserved to laureates, while Virgil sported a long bird, completely out of fashion at that time, and therefore suggestive of his coming from another age. Following their lead, I'll try to show in how many ways the author of the comedy, not Dante the character, not Dante the author, but Dante the man, in how many ways he was a man of his own time. He was the son and grandson of moderately well-to-do businessmen who had made money, buying, selling, and lending money, which was, of course, frowned upon by the church, yet openly and lawfully practiced by everybody. And like many young men who had inherited money, or to put it more properly, land, and needed not to worry how to make a living, he strongly disliked the kind of business in which his parents and ancestors had been involved. As soon as he came of age, being an orphan, and therefore master in his own house, he sold a credit he had inherited from his father, which suggests that he had no wish to be personally involved in business, which in fact he never was, unlike, for instance, his brother Francesco, who was a businessman, buying and selling land all his life. And Dante clearly expressed his opinion of businessmen in convivio, when he declares that he is writing for princes and nobles, both men and women, while it is pointless to approach those who have been busy all of their life with their own affairs because they are not able to understand any loftier matter. As many young men, I said, and we all know at least one other example, Francis of Assisi, who exactly like Dante in his youth, despised his father's business and company and dreamed of moving to a higher social circle, buying horses and weapons, becoming a knight, socializing with the sons of his city's aristocratic families. Dante did that too, but unlike Francis, he had a passion which would inevitably put him in contact with the sons of knights, I mean poetry, writing love poetry in the vulgar language. Until recently, as he remarks in the Vita Nuova, 
one could write about love only in Leighton. That thrilling novelty, writing about love in the everyday tongue, attracted a young man of means and education, like Guido Cavalcanti or Forese Donati, people his father and uncles would not have been associated with. They accepted him as one of them, although Forese would not refrain in the well-known Tenzone with Dante from repeatedly joking about his father Alighiero's money-changing transactions and possibly also his bad reputation as a usurer. But this common ground offered by literary exchanges does not mean that Dante didn't share with Francis of Assisi and his own aristocratic friends another passion so typical of their time, horses and weapons. Dante was deeply interested and personally involved <coughs> in the chivalric way of life, which has to be understood as a military and sporting activity for the elite, and his work abound with images taken from that world. When he explains that all the artisans working in a particular field have to take instruction from the end user, the first example that comes to his mind is that, I quote, the sword maker, bridle maker, saddle maker, shield maker, and all the trades that provision the art of chivalry must follow the lead of the knight. That he had good horses, we can take for granted. When we remember the passage in which he follows the way human desires evolve from infancy to adolescence, in terms that may not have been strictly autobiographical, but do, however, reflect the experience of his generation in his social class. I quote, thus we can see that small boys at, most desire, at the most desire an apple. And then as time passes, they desire a little bird and later smart clothing and then a horse and then a woman. In a well-known letter after his exile from Florence, Dante laments that he is without arms and horses because of the unexpected poverty into which he has fallen. And this means that previously he had owned both. And after all, at 24, he fought in the great battle at Campaldino, where he was one of the 600 citizen knights from Florence, defined by the chronicler Giovanni Villani as the best armored and mounted that ever came out of the city. He was deployed under the yellow banners of the Sesto of Porto San Piero, where even the past they had recruited, according to the chronicler, the best chivalry and men of arms in the city. And he volunteered was, or was chosen to be one of the 150 knights deployed in the first line of battle who had to be the strongest and best equipped of the whole army. All this points to a young man who, should we be able to forget for an instant the sheer exceptionality of his writing and thinking, was very much a young man of his own time and class. And he shared values and opinions of his own time in a way that may sometimes bemuse modern commentators. A typical example is the episode of the revenge for the murder of his cousin, Jerry Del Bello. You all know this character. On entering Malebolge, Dante and Virgil meet the sours of scandal and schism, mutilated and covered in blood and sores like survivors of some terrifying battle. And Dante suspects that amongst their number, there is a spirit of my blood. Virgil confirms that a little earlier, while Dante was looking elsewhere, he had seen this spirit point you out and threaten fiercely with his finger. And I heard them call him Jerry Del Bello. There follows one of those extraordinary passages in which Dante, the character, openly defends 
the values of the society he lives in, even though they conflict with the moral values that Virgil is trying to teach him. While Virgil, in effect, advises him to leave the wretched man alone, Dante earnestly explains that his cousin is right to be angry with him because he died a violent death, and that death hasn't yet been avenged by those concerned. Dante belongs to the family and is therefore one of the consorti, a word which was very important in the vocabulary of the time. In its etymological sense of people with shared interests, so Dante feels that he too is partaking the shame that they all deserve for failing to avenge their kinsman's murder. And Jerry was well within his rights to be angry and leave without speaking to Dante. Today, many feel hard to accept that Dante could have shared so unhesitatingly this cult of vendetta, but we must be clear about that. Even though a good Christian could find thought for food in reflecting upon that, the obligation, the obligation to avenge a kinsman's murder was nothing less than that, a moral obligation, one of the common values upon which society was founded. No less a figure than Brunetto Latini, why did he celebrate in Dante's time as the man who had teached the uncouth Florentines of his time, politics and ethics, had written in these terms about it, adding with satisfaction that he had seen vengeance taken for offenses whose memory had almost been lost in time. And the law granted it full legal as well as moral legitimacy, so that nobody could be prosecuted for killing in order to avenge a kinsman's death. The earlier commentators, beginning with Dante's own son, Messer Piero, inform us in a matter of fact tone that the revenge, which had not yet materialized when Dante was writing, did eventually find its victim when Jerry's nephews dispatched one of the Sacchettis, the family which 30 years earlier had killed Jerry del Bello. Since the former murder took place in 1287, Dante was full in time to know about it and would have undoubtedly approved, as did his brother Francesco, who several years later in 1342 signed in due form a piece with the Sacchettis in the name of all the Alighieris, since they were now even. So much for Dante the man of his own time. How about his place? We all know he was from Florence and very much attached to his city. Like any other Italian in his time, and perhaps not only then, however much he despised his fellow citizens, in the years after his fall from power. It is worth noting that since his youth, that is, when he was writing the Vita Nuova, he sometimes remarked upon customs that were peculiar to Florence, which seems to mean that he was well-traveled since his earlier years and able to make comparisons that would probably escape his less polished contemporaries. So it happened, for, for instance, that a friend, in the belief that he was doing me a great favor, that is offering him the occasion to meet Beatrice, this friend took Dante to the house of a woman who had, who had got married that very day and where in a room covered with frescoes, the bride sat at a table in the company of many gentle women. Beatrice was amongst them, indeed, and Dante, who didn't expect this, cut a pitiful figure when he suddenly panicked and everyone noticed, so that his friend had to drag him away. Now, this episode is always defined in a cursory manner as a wedding feast, but that isn't really what was happening. That occasion was the climax of a complex and symbolic matrimonial procedure. It is the day in which the bridegroom publicly goes to his father-in-law's home 
and leads the bride, taking her to his own house. It was a rite of passage, and as such, it involved various precautions that underscore the gravity of the moment. This was the reason why those women had surrounded the bride, because in accordance with custom in this city, secondo l'usanza della sopradetta cittade, it was befitting that they kept her company when for the first time she sat down at the dining table in the abode of her bridegroom. End of quote. In a city where men and women lived a very much segregated lives, the bride, who would be on average 14 or 15 years old, clung to the company of women, very much the only company she had known until then, before, in the end, they would leave her on her own to her new life that she would share with a man. Dante and his friend had not been invited to some kind of wedding banquet, but went there in order that the women should be fittingly served. The purpose was to honor the bride and her companions in accordance with an etiquette, emphasizing at the same time the rigid separation of the sexes and their reciprocal acknowledgement. And this, Dante underscores, is the custom of this city. Then again, we have the stunning episode of the death of Folco Portinari, Beatrice's father. It was the custom at the time, and especially so in Florence, according to Dante, that women and men participated the ceremony separately. The custom of the aforementioned city is that women meet up with women and men with men to grieve over such losses. A passage from Boccaccio's Decameron clarifies this. The women went into the dead person's house for the wake and the men waited outside. The custom was so strong that Dante, however much he longed to see his beloved, could only watch and listen to the women as they came out of the house after joining in Beatrice's tears. The women commented upon the depth of her sorrow. And as he heard them, Dante too started to cry, but he knew that he was transgressing the rules and he tried to conceal his tears. When the women discovered this, they were stunned and scolded him. Leave the crying to us. Lascia piangere a noi. Did such rules prevail in other cities too? One would think it's likely, but it is worth noting how much Dante takes care to state that it was the custom of his city, as if he could expect readers from other towns to find it surprising. This was the city where Dante, approaching his thirties, discovered yet another passion, politics. Like all Italian cities, Florence was governed by an intricate concatenation of councils, committees, and boards, which mobilized a broad participation of a great number of citizens. In order to make any decision, councils were summoned by the ringing of bells, agendas were presented, speeches for and against were minuted, and votes taken by either public show of hand or secret ballot. This system produced an enormous quantity of written documents. You remember that for some time, Europeans had developed the technology for manufacturing paper, which replaced much costlier parchment. And this means that we can observe the complex workings of government. It was also, in some ways, a surprisingly modern system. Success in politics, was based on the ability to gain the confidence of the party and create a consensus. You had to know how to speak in public, support the motion, and guide the debate and the vote. Dante had studied this art under the guidance of Brunetto Latini, whose main speciality was Ars Dictaminis, the art of writing official letters and drafting, and drafting public speeches and he applied it expertly. 
While in most cities, this participation in councils was for life and more or less openly favored membership by the most influential families, this was not the case in Dante's Florence. It was the richest Italian city, which meant that it was the richest in Europe. It was a Guelph city protected by the Pope, a friend to the King of France, and full of money, immigrants, trade, and building sites. At the time when Dante left Florence forever, they were building the cathedral, the churches of Santa Croce and of Santa Maria Novella, and Palazzo Vecchio, the new seat of government. Making money was easy and social mobility widespread. This means that in Florence, councils were open to everyone. I mean, adult male citizens who owned a house or a business and paid tax. It was what they defined as a popular government. That is to say, a government of people who owned a business, large and small entrepreneurs, from the wealthy banker to the petty craftsman. The councils were renewed every six months in order to involve the maximum number of citizens. And this they called a broad government. A democracy. Yes, if the anachronism doesn't perturb us too much. After all, Byzantine historians who chronicled the wars of the Italian cities against the emperor called them exactly that. Their form of government, they would write, was a democracia. A democracy comparable to that of Great Britain in the late 19th century, restricted to manhood suffrage with a property qualification. The very poor were not entitled to vote, but the system still aspired to an ideal of shared participatory power. What made Florence's popular government exceptional was that here the businessmen had managed to exclude the nobility from top government posts. In all Italian cities, the conflict between the popolo, merchants and artisans, and the nobility of landed knightly families had offered the main narrative of political life throughout the 13th century. But Florence, was where the people's triumph had been more complete. A set of laws called the Ordinances of Justice declared that all members of powerful knightly families, a list was conveniently added, summing up about 70 surnames, were excluded from being priors or sitting in the main councils, which were to be actually managed by the guilds. Dante, who regularly sat on those councils and was even one of the priors, was of course thought of as a member of the people. And he had even applied for membership of a guild, although he was no businessman on his own and such a membership was essentially comparable to taking a party card. He sat at least twice as a member of the Council of the Hundred which represented the interests of the wealthiest citizens, but with the exclusion of knights and nobles. Its members had to be the best and the most trustworthy of craftsmen and other commoners, plebei. Dante was not, strictly speaking, a craftsman, artifacts, although he had the card, but he was undoubtedly a commoner, plebeius. And in any event, someone trusted by the popular regime, a best and most trustworthy. How far was Dante sincere in serving a popular government from which his best friends, like Guido and Forese, were excluded? They were no plebeians. Indeed, their families were among the most ancient and feared of knightly families. A government which obliged him to be labeled as a plebeian himself. In later times, he will express his disdain towards the very idea of, the, of a communal government and deny city-states any legitimacy. Witness the open letter 
the Epistle 5, written in the time of Henry VII, where he writes that Caesar's government is the only true guarantee of civil life, while all other governments currently ruling Italy, both princely and communal, only represent private interests. But this was in a moment of rage, and one should perhaps not take it too seriously. More important is that in those years, when he was not only a trusted party member, but as Villani wrote, one of the leading governors of our city, the very concept of a popular regime was evolving. It was becoming clear that among those who styled themselves the people, many wealthy families had emerged, that while still cherishing their popular status, which permitted them to be active in politics, maintained, in fact, growing links by marriage and business with the noble families and did not wish to exasperate them. Everything we know about Dante's interventions in the councils and committees of which he was a member shows that he was entirely aligned with this new trend. He was, as comedy commentator Jacopo della Lana would later write, one of the middle class people who had been governing the city, the qui mezzani che reggiano. But he was also a member of a popular elite, which was not very willing to follow the small people in their indiscriminate hostility to the nobility. As the later chronicler Marchionne di Coppo Stefani would write, Florence was governed in those years by people who were technically part of the businessman class, but in fact were people who favored the magnates. Citizenship and membership in the guilds were not sufficient for inclusion in political activity. Ideologic credentials were also required. You had to be a Guelph, and hopefully the member of a family that had always been Guelph taking sides with the church against the empire. There was no place for a Ghibelin in Florence. Someone who thought that Italy would be better off if the emperor had a little more power, preventing the endless warfare between one city and another, as well as the bloody clashes between factions within the same city. Such nostalgia for central government would have made Italy slightly more similar to the kingdoms of England and France. But the Ghibellines had been defeated for good. Many were in exile, and those who had remained in the city had to keep their head down and their mouths shut. Of course, Dante was a Guelph from a Guelph family. Otherwise, he could not have developed a political career. We all remember the pains he takes to extract from Farinata, when he encounters him in hell, a thorough certificate of Guelph orthodoxy for the whole of his ancestors, whom the old Ghibelline leader even declares to have known well, and that they were some of his party's fiercest enemies, something we have a right to doubt, both that the Alighieri's before Dante were such committed Guelphs and that Farinata ever heard of them. But by Dante's time, being Guelph was no longer enough because conflicts between parties did not simply arise from ideological differences, such as support for the Pope or the Emperor. Far from it, they arose above all from the craving for power, government positions, the control of public funds, and the ability to make your friends prosper and to crush your enemies. In Florence, the Guelphs, who had once been a single party, split into two rival lobbies, each of which demanded all the power for themselves. They were called the White Guelphs and the Black Guelphs. Dante always argued that he had adopted an impartial position above the scrum, and that he cared only about unity, consensus, and the common good. But in truth, he too enrolled in one of the new parties, the Whites. He briefly found himself at the center of power in the fateful year 1300, 
when he held the most important position in his whole life, being one of the six priori. Then the white faction was overthrown in a coup and its leaders sent him to exile. The 20 years of his exile reinforced in Dante an awareness that he had surely entertained from the beginning, but that had been, so to say, less urgent. The awareness that besides being a Florentine, he was an Italian too. It is not idle to reflect upon this question. What did it mean to be an Italian in a country which had no political unity, nor would have one until the 19th century? Italy, of course, existed. And it was not only a geographical concept, but a political one. It was a kingdom, even though for the best part of Dante's life, it had been a kingdom without a king. It could even be suggested that the conscience of a common identity rooted in shared interests was reinforced and made popular in Italy when its cities fought against their king. The long struggle against Frederick Barbarossa at the time of Dante's great-grandfather and eponymous ancestor of the Alighieris had been marked by a sustained propaganda about the freedom and honor of Italy and the need to keep foreigners out of the country. It is true that in Dante's youth, this kind of rhetoric was largely unnecessary. The last emperor who had tried to subjugate the city-states, Frederick II, died 15 years before Dante's birth. And he had been more Italian, albeit a southerner, than German. Dante's generation had never really been faced with the prospect of a foreign prince coming from across the Alps to assert his right to rule the kingdom of Italy. And when this happened, at the time of Henry VII, Dante was enchanted since he had long lost faith in the ability of city-states to rule in justice and peace. So one could almost say that unlike in the time of Barbarossa, the notion of Italy had slowly sunk into irrelevance before the time of Henry VII. And it is perhaps significant that Dante did not employ a clear-cut vocabulary to identify the inhabitants of the peninsula and their language. When writing in the vulgar tongue, he never employs the words Italiano or Italiani. He rather calls them Latini. But that becomes Italy when writing in Latin. He consecrated much thought to the language spoken in Italy and its many variants that sounded to him less different and probably were than today's dialects are, but he had no clear name for it. The idioma spoken by the Italy, that is the lingua latinorum, could be recognized by the use of si, si dicunt, the vulgar eloquence, of course, so that il bel paese was the country where one heard this particle, La dove il si suona. But nowhere does Dante call this language l'italiano, as we do. Dante's generation was one in transition. The descent of Henry VII and later of Louis of Bavaria. The election of French popes who deserted Rome for Avignon. The ravages of foreign mercenaries in the wars of the 14th century all conjured to remind Italians that they were one people and their country shared a common destiny. Younger literates like Boccaccio and Petrarca had no doubt about it, and they developed that clear-cut vocabulary that Dante had not known. Boccaccio will be the first one to call Italians men coming from different parts of the peninsula even though their cities could be ferociously hostile to one another. He describes a merchant from Genoa coming to the Holy Land and who, quote, going around and looking around and seeing many merchants, Sicilians and Pisans and Genoese and Venetians and other Italians 
e altri italiani, mixed often with them as a remembrance of his own country. Petrarca, in his Canzone all'Italia, will be the first to say us in order to distinguish between Italians and foreign invaders, calling the Alps a screen erected by nature fra noi e la tedesca rabbia. Later on, in 1378, Caterina da Siena, facing the great schism, will enrage against the Italian cardinals, who after electing an Italian pope, changed their mind and elected a French one. She will accuse them of betraying not just the church, but the Italian fatherland. I quote, talking in human terms, Christ on earth, that is the Pope, Italian, and you Italians, so that you could not be moved by love of your country as with the French. But Dante too had written to the Italian cardinals, gathered in conclave after Clement V's death. He had written in Latin, expressing the common feelings of all Italians, cunctis Italis, and hoping that the Latinorum Gloria would be defended against French usurpations. After the reign of a foreign pope who had never deigned to visit Rome, the prospect of another foreigner appalled him. There's no doubt would later appall him and many Italians, the discovery that Clement's successors had chosen Avignon for good as their official seat and had no intention at all to come back to Rome. Not yet knowing that, Dante nevertheless wrote in 1314 to the Italian cardinals telling them that all other Italians, ceteros Italos, mourn Rome widowed of the church and that they, the cardinals, should be ashamed of it. And the only way to make amends was to fight manly in the conclave for Christ's bride, for the seat of the bride that is Rome, for our Italy, for Italia Nostra. So Dante, in his later years, was probably more conscious of an Italian identity than he had been as a young and proud Florentine. Sure, from this point of view, his Italian vocabulary, with all its outstanding richness, had not yet reached the maturity that we will find in younger authors like Boccaccio and Petrarch, but it really was just a question of vocabulary. A man of his time, Dante was also a man of his own place, and that place was Florence, it was Italy, it was Christendom, and of course, our earth, La Iuola, che ci fa tanto feroci, this paltry plot of land that makes us so brutal, Paradise 22. Thank you very much. Grazie, grazie. Thank you, uh, Professore Barbero, for this uh, beautiful reconstruction of uh, Dante's time and space and place as well as the, the emergence of the idea of Italy in, in Dante and his time. And it, it was uh, uh, a great way to open our, our discussion and to lay the groundwork. And this is the basis of philology as, as, as we know. So thank you for, for that. And I think um, I, I also have to thank again uh, the Instituto Italiano di Cultura for making possible uh, uh, this, this uh, lecture. And I see here uh, Marina and Barbara from the Instituto, so thank you. Um, and uh, we have some time for, for questions. So if, if there is someone wants from, from the audience to ask our, our speaker a question, please uh, um, feel free uh, to either raise your hand or to write uh, in, in, in the chat or um, to jump in. If I may add, uh, yes, I, I, I do realize that my approach and historian's approach uh, was very down to earth and probably very different from the main line of your interests. 
Okay. So uh, okay. uh, this was what was asked <laughs> from me. So this is what I delivered. Uh, mm-hmm. I am aware that this conference will follow a very different line of reasoning. Uh, so I, I will not be surprised and even perhaps relieved if there will be no questions. So <laughs> make no special effort. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please, Joseph. Yeah, I see you. Yes. Right Professor, buonasera. buonasera. I will ask the question in English. Um, we know that Dante, after all, married. What was his concept of marriage? Hard to say. Um, I, I may try to say something about his contemporaries' shared idea of marriage. Um, marriage had basically nothing to do with love. Uh, we know that Dante and his friends uh, and the uh, young men of his generation uh, who could afford it were very much interested uh, with love. We know, of course, you know far better than I do uh, that their opinion about love was complex and very different from our own romantic idea of love. Uh, in any way, love was a great force in their life. Marriage was a very important institution in their lives too, but the two things had almost no uh, relevance, uh, re- one respect to the other. I mean, of course, they fell in love exactly as we do. Uh, meeting, that's me, sometimes uh, meeting a young girl of nine, uh, uh, with a blood uh, red uh, uh, garment. Um, anyway, the experience of uh, desiring somebody, of loving somebody, uh, was basically similar to our own, even if, of course, they elaborated it culturally in a quite different way. But marriage had nothing to do with that. Marriage was a way to go on in life for families. Uh, they usually conceive themselves as members of a chain of ancestors and descendants, successors. Uh, we don't know how much Dante did personally see himself in this way, but we have, of course, elements, uh, his great enthusiasm in, uh, in being able to relate about his great great grandfather, Cacciaguida obviously means that he too sees himself as a male in the chain. So you have to get married. First of all, because everybody has to. It is humanity has at the task of going on. Uh, God won. It is God's will. So everybody must share this in this task. Families want, wish, desire to go on. And it is a family matter which means that many people were married not uh, by their own choice, but by their parents uh, and uh, kinsmen's and friends' choice. With Dante, we have a problem. Since we don't know exactly at what age he married, or to put it better, we have two completely different and uh, not easily uh, acceptable uh, informations. As you know, we have a copy uh, of the marriage, not a copy, um, in, a no, in a later document, in later papers uh, uh, produced by Gemma's, Dante's wife's lawyers, uh, the date of their marriage contract is mentioned, and it is impossibly early when they both their children. On the other side, Boccaccio says that Dante married after Beatrice's death because his friends thought that would be a good way to cure him of his suffering. So which of the two? If he really was married when he was a child, which is not really easy, in fact, it was not the custom of that time, as we could suppose. Uh, This means he had no choice at all. His parents arranged everything. If he really married later, after Beatrice's death, He, of course, married accepting suggestions uh, from France, but he had a word in it. He was not choosing the woman he would love 
all his life. He was choosing the young girl who would uh, keep his house for him, who would go to bed with him, not for pleasure, but for producing children. Of course, anybody expected that a man, a husband and, and, and wife uh, uh, could live together well. It was a very good thing if husband and wife liked each other and could live a reasonably happy life together. But it was not the basis, the ground of the marriage. So, okay. we have <laughs> less information than we would like to about Dante's marriage, but we can be sure that it was a completely different thing uh, in respect to our own post-romantic idea of marriage. Right, thank you for that. There is a, a um, thank you, uh, a question by Alessandro Teres by, by, by uh, at the chat. Do you want to um, make a question, uh, Alessandro? Where are you? Or do you want me to read it? That's fine, I uh, unmuted myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the, the beautiful lecture. So I was uh, wondering uh, how much Dante uh, was different in his attitude to Italy and the Italians that you elaborated uh, a little bit with respect to his uh, friends like Guido Cavalcanti and others. I'm afraid that this is a question I didn't pose to myself. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when I tackled uh, the almost foolish uh, task of writing uh, Dante's biography, and Elisa Brilli, who is here, uh, uh, I think she understands very well what I mean, uh, I, I decided this was to be strictly a historian's work. Uh, which means I didn't uh, analyze uh, Dante's works uh, un unless I could use them as sources for aspects of his life. Uh, and this means, too, that I didn't analyze so deeply as one should Dante's friend's works. Uh, I was not uh, uh, studying a, a poet uh, uh, in the background of the literary life of his time. Uh, I was studying a citizen of Florence in the background of Florence in politics and all that, uh, which means uh, that I would be very happy if somebody else here among our friends could help us, uh, Alessandro, to, to know more about other uh, parts of the Times idea of Italy. Mm -hmm. I sent back the question to everybody here. And, uh, that's a great question. I don't know if anyone wants at this point to jump in. Uh, um, okay. Anyone? Um, yes, but let's continue to Avram, please. Uh, buonasera. Uh, Professor Barbero, what uh, uh, was, was Dante a religious man? And uh, what was his attitude towards the Jews? Uh, his attitude towards the Jews and the Jews, the Jews. Uh, uh, okay, well, um, Dante was a deeply religious man. Um, we need to qualify that. Uh, first of all, almost everybody in his time was religious uh, in the sense that they firmly believed in God uh, and his teachings uh, and the existence of afterlife and paradise and hell, purgatory had been recently added, as you all know. Um, in Dante's time, yes, we begin to live in a society which was so sophisticated that we begin to find single individuals who were suspected of not really believing in God. Guido Cavalcanti famously, of course, um, but they were individuals, and I'm not sure that there, these were not only legends that were built around specific characters, specific individuals. Of course, the existence of atheists was accepted because the Bible itself talks about it. The stupid man uh, thinks in his heart that God doesn't exist. Uh, this is somewhere in the Bible, of course. Uh, and this means that they knew, theoretically, 
that atheists could exist. But in fact, it was very hard to find one. Usually people, no matter how cultivated, uh, strongly believed in God and an afterlife. This doesn't mean, as it would perhaps mean today, that they had a peculiar respect towards the church. Today, in a world where there are uh, religious men, Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, and uh, secularized people who don't believe at all, who have no religion, uh, at least among Christians, I'm afraid my experience is limited to a Catholic country like Italy, among uh, Christians, it is not usual to be openly and vocally critical of the church, the clergy, the Pope, and so on. Because you live among people who are, who are not religious, who have no respect at all towards the church and its teachings. So if you are a believer, you usually tend not to be too openly critical of the church. This was not true in Dante's time. In Dante's time, exactly because everybody was a Christian and there was no problem about that, criticizing the church, the clergy, up to the highest level, the Pope, was perfectly normal, perfectly normal. And it did not necessarily get you into trouble. Of course, it procured you enemies, <laughs> but everything you did procured you enemies. So Dante was a strong believer. He was strongly critical of the church, and there was no contradiction in this. About Jews, I'm afraid I didn't meet with many opinions or interventions by Dante about it. Now again, uh, such a group of uh, colleagues as, the, our, uh, as have met today uh, contains probably persons who could answer this specific part of your question uh, uh, with more experience than me. I'm afraid I didn't speak about this point because I didn't find significant and relevant interventions by Dante that would show anything different from the common opinion of Christian society at his time. That is, the Jews existed. There was no love towards them. They had to exist because, of course, again, the Bible tells the end of the world will come only after the conversion of the Jews. So, of course, uh, we have to accept the existence of Jews. Uh, but they were not liked, not understood. Uh, and I have no reason, but here I would be happy to be corrected by anybody here who knows more. I have no reason to think that Dante didn't share this common opinion of his Christian contemporaries. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roberta, you wanted to add? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, I want to thank Avram for the question. And, uh, you know, Alessandro is brilliant, what you're saying. And I just want to remind that there is Rab, the prostitute in paradise. Jewish prostitute in paradise, which, uh, which, which is, of course, um, for another time of discussion, but I'm just saying that um, uh, this is when we think um, uh, that with Dante, we think to know or we have found how, for example, in this case, Dante perceives the Jewish, here is uh, the Jewish prostitute in paradise. So it's just to make things complex as they are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Roberta. Of course, things are complex. Um, I should perhaps add that uh, mm, they had no love for Jews, and they, but they had no racist conception. Uh, I mean, Jews who converted uh, were accepted with enthusiasm. Uh, of course, not if they had been converted by force of arms as it happened in Spain during the Reconquista. In that case, of course, when you had thousands and perhaps millions of Jews and Muslims who had been forced to become Christians, well, they were usually uh, still despised 
uh, and not readily accepted. Uh, what I'm, but Dante would not have met with such problems. Dante could have met Jewish intellectuals who had converted to Christianity and had become important uh, elements uh, in the machinery uh, of the church because that happened. And towards such people, they had uh, usually uh, only um, friendship and, and trust. So it was exactly because it was not a, a racist biological conception. The fact that the Jewish process could be in paradise, of course, means that we should left, we should leave on one side generalizations about groups. Individuals okay. are some may be different. Uh, Salah Adin, Saladino, uh, is in limbo uh, with the great uh, of uh, antiquity, uh, which doesn't mean, I think, that Dante appreciated Muslims, but individual souls were the single most important thing. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and thanks, Roberta. And Alessandro Vittori, please. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm unable to keep my camera on uh, today. So uh, unfortunately, you won't be able to see me or maybe it's better if you don't see me. But um, the uh, I have, um, um, first of all, a word of appreciation for uh, Professor Barbero's presentation. I, it was uh, it was great. Um, you contextualized uh, uh, Dante in uh, um, in a way that only a historian of your caliber can do. So uh, thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, as far as the question is concerned, um, I would like to uh, uh, agree with Roberta uh, that maybe uh, Dante's view of the Jews was not as negative as, as we think uh, in, uh, in the sense that, um, again, I think it's, it's hard to infer um, an opinion uh, drawing uh, from a source that is a literary source, uh, because of course it's, it's fiction. So we, we don't know exactly what Dante was doing when, uh, for example, he presented the usurers um, in Inferno. And uh, there is a beautiful piece by Rachel Jacob where Rachel Jacob says, um, you know, uh, we don't know exactly what Dante thought about the Jews, but uh, it's clear that none of the usurers that he places in hell are Jewish, uh, which is, uh, I think, a, a very positive um, uh, outlook because, of course, that was. Uh, uh, it was a very common, um, shall we call it, profession for uh, Jews to do in uh, uh, throughout the Middle Ages and, and uh, uh, well, until more recent times. So uh, he identifies very specifically, you know, the Gianfigliazzi, the Obriati, and, and others, uh, and they're all um, Florentine, except for one who is Ravennese and Ravennate. And, um, and, and, uh, and Rachel Jacob's point is that maybe um, his outlook was a little more positive than we think uh, on, uh, uh, on the Jews, simply because uh, he decided not to um, place any of them uh, in, in hell in that particular context. So again, I think it's hard to um, it, uh, uh, draw historical conclusions uh, from this, but at least from the literary perspective, uh, I, I think we can, we can probably say something like that. Um, but again, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Alessandro Vittori, for, for this important um, comment. And um, I think um, we can end this very interesting session and, and um, thank again Alessandro Barbero for, for his wonderful talk. So please join me in thanking him. And uh, um, we will reconvene here in five past six um, for the following panel. Uh, we'll have presentation from Alisa Brilli, uh, Kevin Brownlee, and Roberta Morosini. So uh, please join us again in exactly 13 minutes. So thank you. And uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the presentation, Professor Barbera. Yes. Thank you, you all. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy and honored to introduce the first session on Dante's global vision. Our first speaker is Elisa Brilli, 
that is associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Italian Studies and Center for Medieval Studies. This is the author of Firenze il Profeta, Dante tra Teologia e Politica, 2012, and the co-author of Dante de Vieux Nouvelle with Milani, 2021, that was translated into Italian as Vite Nuove, Biografia e Autobiografia di Dante. She's also the main editor of the critical edition of the Alphabetum Narrationum by Arnold uh, de Lige, 2015, and she co-edited a number of volumes such as, such as Fair Anthropologie Historique du moyen Age with Dittmar and Dufal, Images and Words in Exile, Avignon and Italy during the first half of the 14th century with, with Fenelli and Wolf, 2015, Agostino Agostiniani Agostinismi nel Trecento Italiano with, Bar with Bartuschat and Caon, 2019, and the Dominicans and the Making of Florentine Cultural Identity with Bartuschat and Caon, 2020. Elisa Brilli, she will be speaking the challenges of world literature, Dante, and various ideas of, of, of Europe. Please, as uh, Gur said, I will adopt that. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, I apologize, first of all, for my voice. I hope that you can hear me just fine. Uh, I'm still recovering from COVID. But I didn't want to miss this symposium, so that's the reason why. Um, first of all, I will try to share my screen. Does it work? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Just need to rearrange the windows. Okay, so today uh, I will not talk so much about uh, Dante, poet of world literature, but I will talk about another uh, critical issue, uh, Dante, poet of European uh, literature, which is a sort of close relative from uh, the point of view of history of, of ideas of the problem that interests us today, and uh, that, as I hope, will help us to shed some light also on this uh, topic. So Dante and Europe then, uh, there is a striking paradox, I would say, in the traditional approach to uh, this issue. On the one hand, Dante is often envisioned as one of the most significant authors of European literary tradition, and even if, if not the founder, the first and somehow the best champion of it. Uh, should we look for um, one of the main supporters of this view, Thomas Dornelliot, who has been already recruited, uh, would be our man. To quote him, uh, Dante, nonetheless an Italian and patriot, is first uh, European. By such a statement, I let man to question the image of Dante shaped by the Italian Risorgimento as first and foremost the father of the uh, nation. However, it would be a mistake to reduce Eliot's uh, reflection to a negative aim. To him, Nanta was also the perfect representative of a still unified spirit of Europe, a spirit that he considered lost immediately after the understand. In this sense, Eliot was not only an uh, Dante was for Eliot not only an artistic model, but also the embodiment of that mind of Europe that Eliot wished to restore with his own poetic, intellectual, and of course, political activity. Furthermore, as Copley uh, noticed in an article on plurilingualism and the mind of Europe, Eliot meditation was developed in dialogue with Ernest Robert Kurtzis, who also attributed to Dante a crucial role in his seminal European literature and Latin Middle Ages. Now, this fact is worth recalling uh, due to its influence upon all subsequent narratives of the history of European literature, in which Dante is commonly acknowledged as the first incarnation of the European spirit, exactly like for other scholars, it was the summa of medieval culture, scholasticism, Christian faith, Italian identity, and so forth. Such an approach could sound distant uh, to us, but in fact, it is not. For instance, within the framework of the debate about the Christian origins or roots of European Union, the Centro Dantesco dei Frati Minori Conventuali in Ravenna 
devoted a conference to Dante and Europe published in 2004, to which contributed major uh, Dante scholars such as Chevacci Leonardi, Botani, Mazzotta, Pasquini, and many others. In a similar vein, the late Saverio Bellomo delivered a very important contribution on Dante and Europa, published in the second volume of Il Rinascimento Italiano e l'Europa. On the other hand, however, when it comes to the studies on Dante, Europe is a far less central topic, if not a completely absent one. In the main research tools of reference in the field, let's say the various encyclopedia uh, devoted to Dante, um, one will of course find a reference to the mythological character, the nymph Europa, a victim of Jupiter, who uh, is mentioned in Paradiso uh, 27, and, but not even always, to the geographical notion only. If one considers instead the international Dante bibliography, the best even though far from being exhaustive bibliographical tool available on Dante, for less than 50 titles, Europe is listed as a keyword, and most deal with Dante's European reception more than with Dante's notion or vision of Europe. So to put it bluntly, scholars working on Dante seem to share the assumption that Europe as a geopolitical and or cultural concept is not so pertinent when it comes to Dante, whose vision was shaped instead by the dialectics between three main subjects, of course, church and empire, plus local entities uh, such as the communes, the signorie, or um, local monarchies, which should be uh, subject to the former, at least in theory. So now we can appreciate the paradox to which I was referring at the beginning. The paradox of an author was regarded at the same time as the father of European literature and yet considered as lacking almost any idea of Europe. So what then? Shall we conclude that the mind of Europe as for Eliot did not have in mind any idea of Europe? And shall we really go on working with such a Virgil-like historiographical paradigm? Facesti come quei che va di notte, che porta il lume dietro a sé e se non giova, ma dopo sé fa le persone dotte. So Dante never thinking of Europe, but in reality creating somehow a European identity. To move forward, um, I shall notice that this paradox is not indeed limited to Dante's case, but it affects more broadly 20th century scholarship on medieval Europe. As Carlos Schem observed, and I'm going to quote him in French, but you have the translation below, he semblerait que les historiens se soient mis d'accord depuis des décennies sur le fait que l'idée d'Europe ne constitue pas un phénomène médiéval. Cette opinion a curieusement été acceptée par une grande partie des médiévistes, sans les avoir cependant amenés à exclure des réflexions sur l'Europe au Moyen Âge de leurs publications. Par conséquent, les lecteurs rencontrent fréquemment une structure argumentative qui est devenue quasiment stéréotypée. Tout en reconnaissant que l'idée d'Europe ne serait pas un phénomène médiéval, plusieurs auteurs justifient leur réflexion en affirmant que l'on peut, peut néanmoins parler de l'existence d'une identité européenne pendant la période en question. Indeed, all the classical works in the field taught that even though existing as a geographical concept since the antiquity, an idea of Europe did not take shape until the 15th century, when it replaced the previous and more comprehensive and ambitious category of Christianitas. In this theological account of the birth of Europe, despite, despite various declinations and corrections, three main assumptions uh, seem to commonly survive. First, that medieval times did not have had a geographical notion of Europe. Second, that the idea of Europe replaced that of Christianitas due to the failure of the dream of an always expanding Christianity, which made Christian people somehow feel confined within a specific continent. And finally, that this definition was adopted during and because of the confrontation with the others, first the Ottoman Empire, with the 1453 capture of Constantinople, then the new population encountered in the colonial era. In other words, the new idea of Europe is commonly regarded as the output of a cultural trauma, the admission of the non-universality of Christian faith, 
mainly caused by exogenous factors, the encounters, conflicts with the others. Now, various controversial glosses could be added already here, but let's now turn to Dante and consider what he adds to this problem, if anything. Dante speaks of Europe 10 times plus one where the term does not appear, but the concept in its geopolitical meaning is clearly there. As it is well known, Dante shared the geographical conception labeled as TO maps, according to which the globe, the O, is articulated in three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia, distinguished by the segments of an imaginary T, which correspond to the principal waterways of the world. This vision justifies, for instance, the mention of Europe in the first of the Rime Petrose as the country which is always under the influence of the Sette Gelide Stelle, the seven freezing stars of the Great Bear. While Europe actually is not a continent, Eurasia is, and its eastern borders have always been subject to, to dispute, to Dante, Europe appeared separated from Asia neatly by the Hellespont which the Persian king Xerxes dared to pass thanks to a bridge made of boats. And this is something that Dante recalls in the uh, Monarchia. And we can also retain from this passage the negative value that Dante gives to the presumption of transgressing Europe's borders, and which is confirmed by another mention of this exemplum in the uh, Purgatory. And of course, Dante had other I geographical ideas about Europe, for instance, the uh, three-cornered uh, form uh, of it and the identification of its borders. Dante, however, also had a more than geographical idea of Europe, as it is evident from the De Vulgari Loquencia. In the first book, chapter eight, uh, Dante describes how after the failure of the uh, Tower of Babel, the human race was originally born in the East, flowed across the three continents and how a part of it populated Europe. Dante also explains that these people at Edioma Trifarium, corresponding respectively to the Southern Europe, to the Northern part, and finally to the Eastern part, bridging between Europe and Asia. These distinctions are then further detailed in this chapter. In paragraph four, the northern part is said embracing from the Danube to England included. In paragraph five, Dante quickly gets rid of Greek, a language that he did not know, as you know. And finally, starting from paragraph six, his attention focuses on the Southern Europe and the subsequent, according to him, to partition of this language in the language dot, doin, and c. All of this is well known. And here you can see uh, a scheme of the system of derivations, as well as its rendering on a TO map uh, of Europe taken from Newdy, uh, 1938. So scholars usually recall this chapter as a proof of Dante's curiosity towards language, given that the unity claimed uh, for the Lang, Doc, Doyle, and C corresponds almost precisely to the historical Romania. Yet, I shall underline with another uh, historian, Jean-Luc Guillet, uh, something else. Though Dante's focus is certainly on Southern Europe and the Italian peninsula, nonetheless, Europe provides him with the framework for his account, while nothing is said about the languages spoken elsewhere after Babel. Such a claim about the European original linguistic unit, no matter how wrong in historical terms, shows Dante's feeling that Europe was something more than a purely geographic concept. Let's also observe in passing that, according to him, such a European unit precedes the, ca the coming of Christian religion, and therefore, under this respect, it also precedes the notion of Christianitas. Other passages, too, show that in Dante's eyes, Europe constitutes a sort of community. When Corrado Manaspina evokes in Purgatory 8 his noble lineage, the pilgrim exclaims that all Europe knows the region from which the Manaspina came, the Lunigiana, because of the fame. This formula underlines emphatically the extension of Manaspina's fame 
one of the families who lost the Dante during the darkest phase of its banishment. And Europe, nor Italy, nor the globe, provides the scale of reference to indicate an homogeneous community of customs, values, and public opinions. This scale, by the way, was already sketched in the previous count of the Purgatorio. In Purgatory 6, Dante offers a dolly shot about a special place of the anti purgatory, the so called Valletta dei Principi Negligenti. And like his model, Sordello, he lists a series of rulers. The striking element here is the de facto European dimension of this survey, which of course includes also, and in the first place, the Italian peninsula. So once again, Europe appears to be something more than a purely geographic frame. It is instead a set of places and powers interlinked in a whole. But which kind of community is this one then? And here is the problem because Dante's political theology does not provide us with any clear cut answer. Instead, it bears witness to a fundamental tension between universalism and we can say Europeanism. No no doubt Dante believed in the universality of Christendom and no matter how this makes us feel nowadays, it was a first supporter supporter, of crusades. And nevertheless, when in the diptych formed by the Count 11 and 12 of the Paradiso, he explained that St. Francis and St. Dominic are the two princes and champions appointed by Providence to save the church. This renovation is depicting, depicted again on a European scale. Their universal mission is somehow comprised between the oriental birth of Francis, who was born, Dante says, in Assisi, Ascesi, and the occidental origin of Dominic, originally from Spain. While this double portrait is intended to convey the idea of a totality, that of the Christian world spiritually renewed by the joint effort of St. Francis and St. Dominic, it is in fact characterized as European and even as Western European. In the same vein, Dante intended, we all know that, the, the empire to be universal, coextensive to the human race. And this is the main argument of the monarchia, where, for instance, Dante argues for the universal origin of the empire by underlying that Aeneas ancestors came from Asia, Europe, and Africa. In the same vein, when he was writing to Henry VII, he claimed that his empire should have not been limited to Italy, nor to the three-cornered Europe. Yet, This universal power also argued for a sort of European privilege. In the De Monarchia, Dante criticizes the papal claim of being entitled uh, to invest in terrors. This power cannot have been given to the church by the church itself or by the empire, nor Dante says from the consent of all men or of the most exceptional among them. Because, and this is the quote you have on the screen, Not only Asian and African people, but even the greater part of Europeans are contrary to such an idea. The historical reference is, of course, to the fact that the Greek church would have not recognized the authority of the Roman popes over the empire. However, what is interesting here is the argument. In a generally universal empire, the agreement of two continents, one of which, by the way, Asia, is believed to be twice larger than the two others, against a claim should be far enough to dismiss such a claim. Nevertheless, in Dante's mind, Europe matters more than Asia and Africa. Even the greed or part of those who live in Europe are contrary to such a claim and therefore it's wrong. Can we argue then for uh, a kind of Dante's Eurocentrism? I think that we can, I think that we must, under the condition of making clear that this is not something that they have theorized, is not an option, is not a doctrine, is a component de facto and not completely justified of his field of vision. This expression is to be taken not only as a metaphor. Once in the Empyrean, Beatrice invites Dante the Pilgrim to look down for the last time at the word. 
dall'ora che io aveva guardato prima, io vi dimosso per me tutto l'arco che fa dal mezzo al fine il primo clima. Sicché io vedea di là da Gade il varco folle d'Ulisse e di qua presso il lito nel qual si fece Europa dolce, carco. The reference is to the columns of Hercules and to the Phoenician shores where the near Europa was kidnapped, according to the myth, and scholars have then normally focused on the allegorical meanings of this reference and also discussed this unusual matching between Europe and Ulysses. I would like instead to attire your attention on what Dante affirms he saw. From the shores of the Anatolian Peninsula to the Strait of Gibraltar, what Dante saw corresponds to the whole Mediterranean, of course, as it, but also, as it is made clear by the reference to the ancient meat, it corresponds to Europe. This fact is even more striking when compared to the model after which this vision was conceived, the Somnium Scipionis, from the Repubblica. There, Scipio benefited from a cosmic vision of the universe. He saw all the globe. Dante the Pilgrim, instead, even though he certainly shared the same system of values, when he looks down, saw the Mare Nostrum and the continent that constitutes the center of his horizon. It's time to conclude, and I would like then to come back to the paradox from which I started by saying that we should certainly renounce the idea of Dante as the mastermind of Europe, no matter how fundamental his work was in defining a new cultural and literary tradition. However, Dante had, sorry, I forgot to show you this one. Uh, Dante had some ideas of Europe. He had, of course, a geographic idea of Europe, but also in combining his sensitiveness for languages with the biblical account and his geographical conception, he argued for a European original linguistic unity. Furthermore, conceived Europe as an autonomous community and a fundamental tension subsists between the universalism of his political theology and the de facto Eurocentric way of conceiving it. Is Dante alone in this uh, vision? In a beautiful essay entitled Il Papato Medievale e il Concetto di Europa, Agostino Paravicini Bagliani examined the occurrences of the term in official papal letters. His exam underlines that while the papal discourses during the 13th century was completely dominated by the notion of Christianitas, in the following century, the Bolla by Benedict XII, Vas Eleccionis, suddenly presents an articulation of the territories subjected to the papal power, which is clearly European. As Paravicini has argued in a more recent article, this new European way of figuring the papal jurisdiction is to be linked to the curious installation in Arignan and to the consequent crisis of the previous Ordo of the Christianitas, which was centered on Rome. Benedict's idea of Europe is quite different from Dante's one, and nonetheless, as for Benedict, Europe exists in Dante's mind as a de facto focus of his field of vision. Moreover, as for Benedict, the adoption of this focus seems to have less to do with external factors, which are not a major issue at the beginning of the Trecento, than with a series of internal shifts cultural as well as geopolitical, that made perceive Europe as a well-working frame of reference, which is to say as an upfront alternative to think of the world in a different perspective. In Dante's case, the aim was likely to disentangle the spontaneous identification between Christianity and the jurisdiction of the Church of Rome. In Benedict's Bulla, to propose the new jurisdiction of a church now far less Roman than what it used to be. Finally, in Dante's mind, this Eurocentrism stays perfectly consistent with the most traditional claims for universalism. And this is perhaps the most important point if we wish to provide an honest account of subsequent European imperialism and colonialism, including Dante's controversial legacy in such a global or if you want, in such a word perspective. This is, I think, one of our challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grilli. 
I would uh, suggest, but tell you, you what you prefer, uh, if to have all the questions at the end of the three talks. Of course. But, yes. Okay. So because maybe we will have more time to open up the discussion. It seems to me that our, the teams are interrelated. So uh, the second speaker is... Uh, Kevin Brownlee, that is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Romance Languages at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published extensively on medieval French and Italian literature. In addition to scores of articles, he has authored and co-edited several seminal volumes in the field of medieval and Renaissance uh, literature, including discourses of authority in medieval and Renaissance literature, the New Medievalism, The Rethinking the Romance of the Rose. He has recently completed articles on Boccaccio's Dantean Miracle in the Decameron, on music and act of song in Dante Purgatorio in Paradiso, on Dantean subtext and Petrarchan identity in the Africa, and on the three hybrid animals in the Dante Commedia. He's also published articles on Christine de Pizan, three late works, as well as, as, well as on René d'Anjou, notion of genre, in his livre de corps de mort et pré. Professor Brownlee. Thank you very oh, much. Sorry, I have to say what is in the title of your lecture. <laughs> okay. Delineating Dante's boundaries, problematizing the universal in the Commedia. Please, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, I, I will be speaking about this um, uh, idea of delineating Dante's boundaries, problematizing the universal in the Commedia, and, and sticking most uh, importantly to the text of the Commedia uh, as such. Uh, in, in terms of uh, Dante's historical life, I am uh, particularly uh, uh, grateful to Elisa Brilli and her uh, uh, co-author, uh, Dante de Vie Nouvelle, um, uh, which just came out in 2021. Okay, uh, uh, my paper today begins with a detailed consideration of how Dante defines the political and geographic entities that figure in the world of the Commedia. Uh, on the one hand, I examine the vertical access of time from past to present. There is a particular focus on the Roman Empire and its transformation into the Holy Roman Empire. On the other hand, I look at the horizontal axis of time, uh, considering the various countries that exist in the present of the poem. In conclusion, uh, I will consider in light of these various geographical differences, what would be the significance of Dante's claim to universality in uh, political terms. In the first place then, uh, let us look at Dante's elaborate portrayal of the political Roman Empire as being transformed into the Christian Holy Roman Empire with both being explicitly placed under the will of God. Of particular relevance in this context is Justinian's extended discourse in the heaven of Mercury, Paradiso 6, lines 34 to 96, as well as his scathing denunciation uh, 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 there of the contemporary Guelph and Ghibelline as being absolutely inadequate as successors. Of equal importance is Casaguida's explicit pointing out of the great crusaders of the cross of souls in Paradiso 18. Finally, I consider the presentation of Henry VII as the last legitimate Roman emperor uh, with uh, uh, Beatrice's famous articulation of his empty throne in the celestial rose in Paradiso 30. Dante's treatise uh, uh, of uh, Monarchia is, I think, also relevant here. In the second place, I would like to analyze the geographical differences between the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, but particularly in terms of Christianity in Dante's lifetime, as it is presented in the Commedia. 
I am especially interested in Germany, uh, defined by Dante in the De Bulgaria Eloquentia, uh, uh, book one, uh, uh, chapter eight, uh, uh, quote, uh, uh, that whole area that extends from the mouth of the Danube or the Mediotide de marshes to the westernmost shores of England, and which is defined by the boundaries of the Italians and French and by the ocean, uh, end of quote, and uh, I'm, I'm quoting from Steve Botterill's edition and translation. Uh, this area includes for Dante the vernaculars of, quote, the Slavs, the Hungarians, the Teutons, the Saxons, the English, and several other nations, end quote. Dante thus defines all of the vernacular languages of Central and Eastern Europe as derived from a single proto-language uh, uh, and linked this proto-language uh, to the Holy Roman Empire. In this case, of course, France, Spain, and Italy, uh, that is the countries that speak the Romance languages, would simply not be a part of the Holy Roman Empire. And in addition, the vastly reduced Byzantine Empire in the East during Dante's lifetime would be Christian, but not Catholic. Uh, finally, the southern and eastern shores of the Mediterranean were, of course, Muslim, uh, with Jerusalem seen by Dante as the center of the world, of course, in, is, 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 of course, in Muslim hands, but with a significant Christian population. In light of these geographical differences, what is the significance of Dante's claim to universality in particular terms, in political terms? If he is claiming a Christian rather than a geographical universality, does he exclude all non-Catholics? Uh, what is the status of conversion or possible conversion, especially in terms of the enormous Muslim dominated areas? Finally, how does Dante protagonists evolving concepts of the inadequacy of mere human understanding of divine concepts, such as justice in Paradiso 20, work out in this context? How can our modern concepts of universality at all function here? I start then with a brief examination of the vertical axis of time in the Commedia. The history of the Roman Empire is divinely ordained in detail by Justinian speaking in Paradiso 6 in the heaven of Mercury, as Robert Hollander has elaborately and insightfully demonstrated. Uh, 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 this is, as he remarked, the only canto in the entire Commedia that is spoken by a single voice. First, the Roman people are explicitly identified as following the eagle, the bird of God, Lucel di Dio, uh, uh, from their beginning with Aeneas, identified as l'antico che la vina tolse. Uh, uh, this sacred status then continues with Turnus's execution by Aeneas for his having killed Pallas, whose death is thus presented as the founding of the Roman kingdom itself at the end of Virgil's Aeneid in book 12, uh, lines 940 uh, to 50. Roman history is next presented through its kings and its republic as following the eagle of God. The key connecting uh, of Rome and Christianity is explicitly stated by the speaking character Justinian from the beginning of the Roman Empire on. Julius Caesar's conquests and his final coming to Rome in Paradiso 6 are linked to the divine will, quote, uh, when all heaven will to bring the world to its own state of peace, presso al tempo che tutto il ciel vuole ridur lo mondo a suo modo sereno. Augustus Caesar, uh, next, is linked to the birth of Christ as the divine eagle definitively establishes global peace. 
Tiberius Caesar is presented as having presided over the crucifixion of Jesus, while Titus Caesar takes vengeance for this divine sacrifice. At this point in the text, there is an immediate continuation from the Roman Empire to the founder of the Holy Roman Empire, who is identified as the very next political figure to be mentioned. Uh, uh, let me quote here, e quando i dente Longobardo morse la Santa Chiesa, sotto le sue ali Carlo Magno vicendo la soccorse. Then beneath its wings went Lombard tooth bit Holy Church, Charlemagne in victory gave her comfort. Not only does this Tetzarim uh, uh, effect a direct spiritual connection between the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, but the opening words of the second line explicitly identify the Holy Christian Church for the first time in the entire Roman sequence. The church is in this line directly linked with the wings of the eagle, the sign of God, and of Rome. The two key exceptions to this important chronological linkage of the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire in Paradiso VI are the two named rulers of the empire from Constantinople, <laughs> the Eastern Imperial Capital. The first of these, of course, is Justinian himself, who reigned from 527 to 565. He speaks throughout the canto and presents himself as the compiler of all previous Roman law codes uh, into their final effective version, which functions in Dante's own lifetime a good 750 years later. It is quite significant that the order employed by Dante author involves three aspects. First, Justinian is directed by Pope Agapetus I uh, from AD 533 to 536 in Rome to conform to the new church orthodoxy concerning the natures of Christ. It is only after he has followed the Pope in the true Christian faith that Justinian turns to his task of reformulating all of the treatises of Roman law. His third feature is his command of Belisarius to successfully reconquer the Western Europe, Western Europe from the Goths, uh, especially uh, uh, Italy, uh, and I'm much more concerned with what Dante is doing in the Commedia than with the so-called real historical um, uh, distinctions here. The second key figure named in Paradiso VI is the Emperor Constantine, who appears in the canto's opening two lines, where he is shown as moving the sacred eagle from west to east. He, of course, was the first Roman Empire to, uh, emperor to establish the imperial capital, not in Rome, but in Byzantium, which he renamed Constantinople. He ruled, of course, over the entire Roman Empire. His soul is located in the heaven of Jupiter, uh, uh, where he constitutes the central section of the figure of the eagle, uh, the eagle's uh, uh, eyebrow. Uh, this key figure is both Roman and Christian, and its place in Dante's vision of heaven is quite important in linking the two, Roman and Christian. I will be returning to it at the end of my current paper. The final importance for the Holy Roman Empire occurs in Paradiso 30, uh, uh, lines 133 to 38, in the famous passage where Beatrice uh, points out to Dante protagonist the empty chair reserved for Henry VII, the Holy Roman Empire from 1312, who is closely linked to Dante the person and who dies in 1313. 
Uh, in quel gran seggio che fu gli occhiziani per la corona che già ve supposta, prima che tu a queste nozze ceni stederà l'alma che fia giù agosta dell'alto arrigo eh, che ca di rizzare Italia verrà in prima che uh, in prima che el sia disposta. In the great seat which draws your eyes for the crown already set above it, before you shall dine at this wedding feast, that is to say, you, you shall die, uh, shall sit the soul of noble Henry, who on earth as emperor shall attempt to set things straight for Italy before she is prepared. Let us now briefly look at the horizontal axis of time as it exists more or less at the time of the Commedia's conclusion in around uh, 1320, 21. This is particularly important in terms of the geographic and religious entities, which Dante addresses directly in his great poem. Three linguistic entities are at issue in the way that Dante conceives of Europe, uh, both in the De Vulgari Quencia and in the Divine Comedy. Uh, first, there is the Holy Roman Empire, including England in uh, uh, Northern Europe, with Latin as its learned language that is different from the various spoken vernaculars. Uh, Scandinavia is, of course, included here. Secondly, there is the territory of what he calls Southern Europe, uh, in which Latin as the learned language is directly related to the spoken vernaculars that have developed around it, that is the Romance languages, Italian, French, and Iberian. Third, there is the Greek group with the learned language being ancient Greek, which of course Dante did not speak, but was quite aware of, uh, 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 and the spoken vernacular being Byzantine Greek. The Byzantine empire is explicitly presented as being, quote, partly in Europe and partly in Asia, end quote, which here of course means Asia Minor. In terms of religion, basically the greater part of Europe is depicted as Christian, that is to say, Catholic. The Byzantine Empire, however, was Christian but Orthodox, while the Fourth Crusade of, 13, of, of 1202 to 1204 had involved the, the Latin, uh, i.e. Uh, Italo-French taking of Constantinople, by 1261, the Greeks had recaptured this important capital under Michael VIII Paleologus, who reigned as Byzantine Empire, uh, Emperor, sorry, from 1261 to 1282. Uh, he established the Paleologan dynasty and systematically opposed Latin power as well as the papacy in Rome. Uh, Michael the eighth son, uh, Andronicus uh, Peleologus the elder, ruled a long time from 1282 to 1328 when he abdicated, dying in 1332. Dante considered the Byzantines to be Christian schismatics because they did not recognize the Roman Pope. In this context, it is particularly important to mention the final two cantos of the heaven of Mars, Paradiso 17 and 18. Here, Cacciaguida speaks openly and in detail of the future exile from Florence of Dante protagonist, Paradiso, in Paradiso 17, followed by his key response in a manner that conflates Dante protagonist with Dante poet in Paradiso 17, 106 to 120, uh, uh, which Cacciaguida then answers in explicit valorization of the entire divine comedy, of the entire commedia in, in Paradiso 17, 124 to 42. 
In the following canto, uh, Paradiso 18, the explicit naming of the eight stars of the heaven by the ninth uh, uh, involves the Old Testament directly backing up the medieval struggles against the Muslims. Beginning with Joshua, we then get Judas Maccabeus, Charlemagne, Roland, Guillaume, Renoir, Duke Godfrey of the First Crusade, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 1096 to 99, the first Latin king of Jerusalem, uh, Robert Gistard, 1085 to uh, 86, defeats the Saracens in Puglia, all are spoken by Cacciaguida himself, who fought and died in the Second Crusade, uh, killed in 1147, and is the direct ancestor, uh, spiritual and physical, the great-great-grandfather of Dante Alighieri himself. Uh, if Dante Professor Dante Brownlee, is... you have five minutes left. Oh, okay, that's fine, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, if Dante presents himself as a crusader here, two things are accomplished. Uh, first, the holy places of the Christian Near East, beginning with Jerusalem, are explicitly included in the Commedia's overall area that the poem addresses. Second, particular importance is given to the Muslims and to the territory that they unjustly control. In this context, the Commedia's presentation of exactly how Islam is meant to be understood is quite significant. In Inferno 28, the first figure seen by Dante protagonist in the ninth Bolgia is Mohammed, who is split from his chin to dove si trulla, uh, uh, where men fart with his entrails dangling between his legs. He tells Dante and Virgil uh, uh, that Ali precedes him with his face split open before explaining that this punishment is repeated with each circling of the bulge. All of the other souls punished there are from the Christian community, and each has, when alive, been a, a sower of scandal and schism, seminator di scandalo e di schisma. It is important to note that these two originary Muslims, Muhammad and Ali, are not presented as uniquely different, racially different, uh, uh, but rather as linked with Christian schismatics, uh, with their overall crime being shared by other Christian schismatics. Thus, the Commedia dramatically recognizes the Muslims, but it does not credit them with a different uh, valid religion. It sees them as extreme schismatics. Quite relevant in this context would be Jack Tannos's recent book with Princeton, The Making of the Medieval uh, Middle East. Finally, Dante looked to India to consider the, the key question of whether the completely virtuous and morally upright human being should be saved by Christianity in Paradiso 19. Here, the eagle poses the following question to Dante protagonist. Uh, uh, che tu dicevi, quote, un om nasce in alla riva di Lindo e quivi non è chi ragioni di Cristo né chi legge, uh, né chi le lega, né chi scriva e tutti i suoi voleri e atti buoni sono quando ragioni umana vedi senza peccato in vita o in sermone muore non battezzato e senza, e senza fede o e questa giudizia che il condanna ove la colpa sua se e non, e non crede uh, uh, for you have often asked quote a man is born upon the banks of the Indus in India where no one there to speak or read or write of Christ and all that he desires, everything he does is good as far as human reason can discern. 
He is sinless in his deeds and in his words. He dies unbaptized, dies outside the faith, wherein lies the justice that condemns him, wherein lies his fault if he does not believe. The ultimate answer is given by the ego itself and Teodolinda Barolini's chapter two in her forthcoming book, Dante's Limbo, the Cultural Other, Infants and Social Justice, is quite relevant in this case. Theo notes with insight that both Trajan and Raphaeus, who are unbaptized, are found saved and emphatically placed in the eye of the ego. His definitive words on the deeply incomprehensible relationship between human reason, no matter how well developed on the one hand, and divine truth necessarily conveyed imperfectly to human beings on the other. The eagle sums up his position in the following lines, last quote, uh, roteando cantiva e dicea, quote, Quali son le mie note a te che non le intendi? Tal è il giudicio eterno e voi mortale. Wheeling, it sang, then spoke, quote, as my notes exceed your understanding, such is eternal judgment to all you mortals. In Dante's world, there will necessarily always be a disjunction between God's revelation and human understanding, between la giudizia sempiterna and il vostro mondo, ultimately between logic and love. Dante's ultimate claim to universality in terms of the audience that he addresses depends on an important distinction that between Dante poet and the extraordinary artistry of the Commedia itself versus the situation of the individual reader of the Commedia or Dante protagonist himself who must make a behavioral choice after getting through, after considering, considering personally the entire work. Because fully reading an extraordinary work of art or affecting a personal choice by behavior uh, are not at all the same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. So <clears throat> we're moving to our last speaker for, for tonight, uh, Professor Roberto Morosini. He was a professor of Romans, languages and literature at Wake Forest University. She's currently a visiting fellow at the IAS of the University of Bologna. Her research interests lie in the Mediterranean, meta-literary and geocritical studies, and spatial and cartographic writings from Dante to the Renaissance island books. Part of plan, pan-Mediterranean research evolve around the study of Christian-Muslim relation and misrepresentation of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam in the Italian Trecento. She has first found and published the life of Muhammad by Paolino Veneto and Boccaccio, now in forthcoming volume on Boccaccio and Islam with the Greuter. She is the author of several articles on Boccaccio and Dante and the author of Il Mare Salato, Il Mediterraneo di Dante, Petrarca e Boccaccio, 2020, nominated for the International Literary Prize, uh, Maretica. Today's presentation stems from her visual and literary interest in the books as keeper of knowledge, knowledges in Dante Commedia, as in her 2018 Dante il Profeta, Il Libro, with new findings on Dante and Francis. Tonight she will talk Tra discordanti liti, Dante, Tommaso and Francesco, on the Orient and the Book of Islam. Professor Morosini. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's quite hard to talk after Gur, uh, wonderful, brilliant introduction, uh, Alessandro Barbero, Elisa Brilli, and Kevin Brownlee. Really, um, I'm really humbled and happy to be here. So um, I choose to start this um, conversation uh, I, um, that is, it is really meant to be throwing some uh, points for discussion um, um, about, I, I choose this image so, so that to provoke some, um, some, again, points of discussion. And uh, 
Um, this image has all the elements that lead to the discussion around the book uh, that Francis holds open in front of the Sultan and the Saracens when he went to Egypt in 1219. So we all recognize this image and um, uh, the reason why I want to start with this because I will also conclude with this. So um, the book is at the center of my attention because uh, it has ties with um, uh, the revolutionary Im image of Francis as a reader and as a doctor of faith as Dante presents him in Paradise 11 and not as the Poverello of Assisi as he stands in front of the Sultan is revolutionary, since uh, all the other illustrations of uh, uh, the saint uh, Francis in front of the Sultan do not bear any presence of the book. So uh, let's go back to our image. As I said, I choose it because it holds ties with the uh, image of uh, uh, Francis in Paradise 11 and in the Commedia, um, as I, I, I should say, but also with um, the image that um, the, the Thomas, um, that, that the Thomas is portrayed in the uh, artistic visual uh, tradition. Uh, Thomas Aquinas introduces um, uh, Francis in the, in the Commedia and um, uh, Francis is, and Thomas is always represented with open book from which you see those beams of sun that are spread uh, we will go back to this, but this is the usual uh, image that the tradition, visual tradition uh, gives us of Thomas with open book, Averroes, as you see, is always uh, with a closed book. Underneath is the triumph of Thomas. This is the, uh, later on, Filippino Lippi, the triumph of Thomas in the Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. Uh, as you can see in the more details, uh, Thomas triumphs is the triumph of the book. So um, Thomas uh, introducing uh, Francis uh, and Thomas being uh, the one that uh, gives to Dante the idea of um, Mohammed uh, having uh, dismantled the holy book uh, by putting together fables with false doctrine. So all these elements will lead us to uh, again, to the image of, Fran uh, of Francis in the Commedia and also the idea of the book. So again, uh, Coppo di Marco Valdo, uh, the image I chose at the beginning, has ties with Thomas' book, open book, and with the book of Mohammed. In this beautiful image, one of my favorite uh, I found in, uh, in uh, putting together a book on Dante and, uh, uh, and Islam, um, Mohammed is, is, is open book. And uh, on the right, you see how the, uh, uh, the moment um, Mary is being uh, announced uh, by the angel Gabriel, uh, that uh, sequence is um, already telling us that this book by Mohammed is going to dismantle the, um, the book, uh, the holy book. Uh, so um, again, um, I talked about this in, uh, in, uh, in my book, again, Dante, Profeta e Libro. But uh, so as we go along with this open book in Coppo di Marco Valdo that Francis is, op is, is, op is uh, keeping in his hands open, we saw how many ties already has with Thomas Aquinas that is presenting Francis in, uh, uh, and celebrating Francis in uh, Par uh, Paradise 11. Uh, it all ties with the book of Muhammad. And, um, and this brings me to, again, um, the book of Mohammed leading uh, Dante to punish, according to me and to what I've, uh, I've been studying in the past years, to the punishment, uh, the very unusual punishment um, that he uh, thinks for Mohammed. Mohammed would have um, brought about a schism because of this book of Islam that is the result of uh, as Thomas Aquinas said, of fables and, uh, and uh, uh, moments from uh, the Bible. So it's a, it's a forged book. It's a, uh, um, he has been manipulating this book so that um, uh, his contrapasso reflects that mutilation he has brought about to the holy book. Now, um, uh, the Coppo di Marcovaldo uh, Francis uh, with the open book also 
brings me to the main, um, maybe the main point uh, I wanted to make about the importance of the book that brings us always back to Dante, uh, Sacrato Poema. So um, uh, the book of, uh, of uh, the advantage uh, of uh, such a geocritical approach to, um, that, that is generated around the Commedia and by the Commedia, um, for me, uh, is a way to contribute to this conference by uh, bringing out the challenge that we as a scholar and as a professor have in bringing back the philology into the classroom, bringing back the philology in the text into this world literature. So to um, ask questions about um, the artistic representation of the Orient and the uh, role of the book in the Commedia. So um, as we reflect upon the, uh, the, the, the representation of the Orient, the artistic representation of the Orient that Coppo di Marco Valdo is exposing us, I find a lot of, uh, a lot of co um, correspondences with the uh, artistic representation of the Orient in the Commedia. You see how um, on the audience um, of uh, the Muslim, is represented not as uh, violence, not as barbarians. They are represented dignified as a dignified audience who's listening with attention to what Francis has to say. And Tara Frugoni um, pointed at one, of course, uh, er, er, Tara Frugoni pointed at one aspect of this representation, which is the, um, the faces are quite large, quite big, uh, almost bigger than, uh, and they are bigger than the face of Francis and the other characters in the painting because uh, to show how uh, attentive this audience and respectful was. So um, the, the, the Coppa di Marco Valdo representation of the moment uh, Francis is, is encountering the Sultan and the Sarkasen uh, has a lot to share with the representation of the Orient uh, and the representation of the Muslims in the, in the poem. So um, uh, the, uh, the discussion around the Orient that is brought about by the representation and the role of the book and the Commedia, I found this uh, important. So to see that uh, in, uh, um, in the poem, um, as Colchetto uh, di uh, Marsiglia reminds us about the discordanti liti, uh, the Mediterranean is not there to define a uh, sharp line between the good and the bad, and so the Saracens and the Muslim. Instead, it shows uh, the awareness on Dante's part, which is revolutionary, uh, that a different coast of the, uh, of the Mediterranean just have different uh, cultural religious habits and a different geological uh, uh, also aspect. So um, the Orient for Dante, as Professor Brownlee also was mentioning, is not the place of otherness. Is just a different place. So um, we return to the Coppo di Marco Valdo's illustration because uh, that's where everything, as I said, starts. So all the uh, um, all the biographers of uh, of uh, uh, Francis uh, tell us about this uh, uh, journey to the Orient. Um, actually, Francis tried several times uh, to to uh, to reach the Orient, the territory of Outremer or you know, Syria, and, um, but there is one biographer that really, um, one biography that really uh, is at the center of this conversation, and is uh, Henri of uh, Avranche, Henri of Avranche. Um, he wrote a Legenda Santi Fra uh, Francisci, sorry, there is, a, there is a, a obvious, uh, obviously there is a problem with uh, uh, Francesco, I made him, he made it to another language, so um, uh, Henri, Henri of Avranche wrote a biography of Francis. And um, he, he, you think about this, he wrote uh, eight long chapters just about the journey to the Orient. And um, what is exceptional about this? First of all, Henri of Avranche is the first non-religious, non-Franciscan biographer of Francis. Second of all, he wrote a poem in Latin, versified poem in Latin. Problem, big problem. Bonaventura uh, requested and made sure 
and probably succeeded to make sure again that the only life of uh, Francis circulating was his own, the Legenda Mayor. However, I did find not only in Paradise 11, but around the Commedia, uh, several moments that Dante seems to have literally taken from this poem. Now, the question about uh, how Dante could eventually put his hands on the Legenda Versificata by Rio Bavranche, since the only life of, of uh, Francis circulating was that by Bonaventura, is not for today. But um, uh, I want to give you one very, very uh, clear example of how uh, Rio Bavranche uh, bears some significance in the Commedia by giving you this passage where um, Harry defines, uh, describes uh, Francis as Dante describes Ulysses. It's quite, it's quite striking. So uh, there are two elements, however, that uh, made me think of uh, ded dedicating um, a, my forthcoming book on Dante and Francis and the Orient. Because there are two elements of striking modernity that no biographer uh, pay attention to the representation of the sea and the Orient. These two elements are, are of an, an extreme modernity, of urgent modernity. Again, for us as scholars and as teachers that go to the classroom and are able to share with students the incredible modernity uh, of Dante, because there is uh, modernity is reflected in Dante's uh, Commedia. So at least when it comes to Francis and, the, and um, uh, his portrait of Francis in um, Paradise 11. So let's start from the beginning. We know that uh, Dante um, encounters um, and hears about Francis from Thomas Aquinas. So um, when we see the uh, verses about the journey to the Orient, we think that it is quite short, the attention Dante dedicates to the journey. However, in the light of uh, uh, Ari's uh, poem, I had to change my entire perspective on, uh, on this canto. And it's quite fascinating and it's very, it's very exciting. And it's the first time I share with anybody. So uh, these this findings, and uh, I am really looking forward to your feedback on this. So uh, Dante, uh, Dante's Francesco, um, we, uh, we know that he was reading from Bonaventura. Uh, <laughs> As, as is uh, normally thought. So uh, we see that Dante Francesco is coming back, but we never read that he went, navigate, that navigavit, which is a verb that Bonaventura uses, is not used by Dante. We don't see to depart, we don't see to go, we only see that he comes back. However, uh, Harry opened my eyes about the importance of this uh, proponent transire, the importance of the movement and every time Eri is talking about uh, Francis' uh, attempts to go to the Orient, he's insisting on one, the intentionality to the movement. So what did Bonaventura say about all this? Of course, as we expect, the East is the place of the infidels. Rome is the place of the fidels. So uh, Thomas of Celano as well, at, before Bonaventura said that, se ne tornò nel paese dei fedeli. But uh, the idea of Bonaventura about uh, everything that is far from Jerusalem was a traditional idea of the world away from Jerusalem, from Rome, is a world of dehumanization. So we see this on the right margin of this map, how what is at the margin is dehumanizing. It's the place of monsters, it's a place of marvelous people, um, and so on. And it's the place of, as in this beautiful image of, uh, uh, from uh, the Livre de Merveille uh, uh, by Mandeville, we see on the margin, we only find the Valley of Hell or monsters. But however, going back to, uh, again, to Harry, this is very modern, it's very revolutionary. We have a lot of movement. We have a lot of dynamism in the, in the poem. And so that opened my eyes, going back to Dante, um, uh, as we will see. So let's stay one second, Ari, because it's quite funny, and I'm sure you shared that with me. So um, Dante, uh, Ari is saying that um, Francis is, uh, uh, is, is trying, and finally he uh, succeeded to go to, uh, to the Orient. 
um, but um, he is complaining and is saying that uh, Francesco should have not traveled to the Orient. In fact, Italians need more uh, if Francesco, a doctor of faith, than the Orientals. And I did make a little joke about, oops, the French, because being a French writing that, it's quite uh, interesting. So uh, again, um, uh, Eri is insisting that uh, um, as Francesco is making different attempts to arrive to the Orient, but he doesn't succeed, um, Eri is saying there is a plan of, a plan of God to make him come back to Italy again because Italians need more than the Orientals the, the preaching, the teachings of uh, Francis. And so um, at one point, um, he um, says that uh, Francesco is like a soldier, Reduce, uh, who's coming back from a war, quite disappointed, returning from a war because he lacked of ministers, he didn't have enough help, so he couldn't convert. And so we have this image of the boat that is pushed back passively by the winds. So here's my point. Uh, it is quite astonishing, it is quite um, uh, surprising to see this passive uh, Francis whose boat is pushed by the winds. However, we all, at least I do, we all, I owe to uh, Harry um, the idea of this movement why Bonaventura is putting first the martyrdom as uh, uh, going to, among the infidels, is, is going to die as a martyr. Um, Harry is shifting the interest on the movement. He's uh, presenting a very human Francis. After all, Francis could have stopped the wind. Francis could have stopped the, the storm. Francis could have done a miracle. Instead, this is a human uh, Francis that um, is accepting the meteorological factors and uh, is a, um, a very, uh, and is a preacher of the gospel. So why Bonaventura is putting the emphasis on the martyrdom as uh, uh, going among the infidels, which means death, uh, Eri is shifting all the attention on the movement, the crossing of the sea. And so the humanity of this man who is, preacher of the gospel. In fact, um, he's uh, uh, itinerant like Jesus. Um, he's the preacher of the gospel in movement. He's on the boat, he's on the road, he's continuously moving because that's what Jesus did. This is the idea of Jesus that is in a marvelous uh, image that I found in the um, Capella Palatina in the Castello Malaspina in Bosa in Sardinia. Jesus is represented as soon as he's born, baby Jesus with the sandals of Francis. And so uh, in a miniature, this assimilation between, um, this assimilation between uh, Francis and, uh, and uh, Francis is found in this miniature. So uh, for, Fra for Henry, um, uh, Francis is the alter Christus, but not because of the martyr martyrdom itself, but because the martyrdom is in imitating Christ in going around and preach the gospel. So going back uh, after reading Harry on, uh, on, uh, on these verses uh, and Dante's uh, uh, Paradise 11, um, my attention went to, uh, again, this dynamism. Um, uh, Francis is the one who preaches Christ and those who follow the martyrs. Uh, the two conjunction and end tells us that uh, the verb redissi contains the movement I was looking for. So we don't have navigavit. We are not being told that it went, but we've been told that it came back. And in that coming back, which is the archaic form of the verb redire, riedere, we have all the idea of this movement. That is exactly what Ari said. In other words, for Francis, for Harry and, Fra and uh, Dante, Francis is the preacher of the gospel. And it's not, an, it's not a coincidence that after this, because of this, this, the thirst of martyrdom and because uh, he found um, that the Muslims were not ready to be converted, he went back to uh, Italian shores. So it's not a coincidence that after this, you have the, the moment 
of Francis becomes officially, if I can say, the altar Christus because he receives the stigmata. So, um, Professor uh, Morosini, you have to wrap up. Yes, I am uh, already. Wow. Okay. So I'm finished. Yes. And so um, the uh, the uh, it's very uh, revolutionary that Dante uh, uh, that uh, Coppola di Marcovaldo is presenting Dante with I mean um, Francis with the open book, and so uh, the uh, the idea that I found that he shares with the with uh, Dante is that the book uh, is the shield and the spears that uh, Francis is, is using is the book that um, uh, in which there is the verace fundamento, in which the truth is old. And so to finish, uh, the book is Jesus, as this incredible uh, illumination uh, portrays, uh, Jesus is the book. Jesus comes out in this in, in beautiful illumination as he was born out of the book. So um, in conclusion, what I try to, 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 to bring out and uh, so forth for your discussion is the role of the book as um, something that uh, conveys into the figure of Francis a self-portrait of Dante as uh, it puts forward in the book uh, the poet of the Sacrato Poema and he celebrates all these books, Thomas' book, Francis' book, and he celebrates himself as a poet. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to... Uh, Alessandro Barbero, Elisa Brilli, Ken Brownlee, Roberta Morosini for your thought-provoking and wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. And we will reconvene tomorrow at 4.30 with a panel on negotiating borders in, Dan in Dante and beyond. That it seems to me to be the leitmotiv that started with Barbero. We are moving down to see where it will lead us. So thank you very much to everybody and really, and refuash le main, Elisa, be well and have a fast recovering. Good night, everybody. And thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night.